Good evening, church. It's a pleasure to be with you this evening. If I, if I do a bad job, you can take it up with Dr. J. He was my preaching professor at UM, so uh, you can thank him for that. I, uh, I was saddened to hear the news just a few minutes ago. Um, Dr. J and I, my last semester, I uh, had a class where every Monday we would only go and eat lunch. That was the class. He would give me coursework to do between the, uh, between the Mondays, and then we would just go to Wenzel's. No matter if I suggested Ruby Tuesdays or not, we went to Wenzel's. And, uh, and that was Dr. J. So he and Ryan are uh, two very personal friends of mine. As a matter of fact, Dr. J prays for me and my fiance every time that we meet, whether it's in his office or whether it's getting lunch or whether it's in passing. Uh, he's always in prayer, and uh, he really is a man who uh, is a genuine pastor. And you were lucky to have a pastor such as him. This evening, would you please stand in honor of reading God's Word? We are in Exodus 2, 23 through 25. Exodus chapter 2, 23 through 25. God's Word says, During those many days, the king of Egypt had died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. And God heard their groaning. And God remembered His covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God saw the people of Israel. And God knew. Let's pray. Father, we thank You. We thank You for this beautiful evening. We thank You even more that Your ear is always open. You are always listening to our prayers. We thank you that we can gather here today to hear your word. I'll be behind the cross and speak through me, Lord. Let it not be my words that we hear this evening, but yours. Father, we thank you and we love you. Be with Dr. J this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. There's a, an old Puritan whose name was Christopher Love, and uh, I can't tell you what what year he was or, or any great thing that he did, but I, I read a passage from a book that he had written or a short sermon, and it was on when prayer is heard. When is prayer heard? And that is always a great question for us. When is prayer heard? And, and his answer was when someone, when a man's heart is right with God. Prayer is heard when a man is reconciled with God and is one with Christ, and is in the right place with God. Tonight, we're going to be looking at Exodus 2, 23-25. If you wanted to title this, I, I would title it Glory and Groans and Persistence in Prayer. There's a beautiful thing about groaning because if, when we get to that point, it means that we have come to a place to where we no longer rely on ourselves. But we only rely on Christ. We only rely on the Holy Spirit and the words that He gives us. We have officially come to a place to where we no longer accept that we can accomplish this task. But it is only the task of Christ. It is the redemption of Christ. It is for the glory of Christ. To catch us up to speed to where we're at in the text, Exodus chapter 1 and the first part of chapter 2 tells us of the birth of Moses. And it tells us of the Pharaoh's reign and, and wanting to kill the, 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 the children of the Israelites and, and those that were in that area. And then it tells us that Moses uh, had killed an Egyptian at the beginning part of chapter 2. And he goes and he, he leaves because the Hebrews had found him out. And he thought he would be arrested and so he had left. And then we come to this passage here and we realize that he had been gone for 40 days. He had been married. He had had a child. And the, the child's name means sojourner of the land. He was a foreigner of the land. He, he was a sojourner. He, he is... One who, who travels along this road and now he has found his place. And it was in these 40 years that there was no cry from Israel. There was no cry. John Calvin tells us of this passage. He says, let this example then teach us to flee to God at once in order that he may make haste to bestow his grace upon us. Let the Israelites be an example to us this evening that when we face difficult times, when we face persecutions, when we face those times in life when we feel that our prayers are not heard, when we face those times in life when all we can do is groan in our prayers, when we face those difficulties in life 
where we have a task that we are praying for and we are praying for God to, to perform and God to do His thing, yet we feel as though we are saying empty words. Let us remember to go to God at once. Israel, at this time, had, between these 40 years, had begun to put their hope in the earthly things. As we, we see, it's, it's after the king of Egypt dies that they begin to call out to God. They'd officially come to the point to where the last bit of hope they had on earthly things had gone away. Their hope in those things did not last, and neither can ours. Our hope is only on the things of Christ. Our hope can only be on the things of God. Our hope can only be in Christ and in the power of God within us through the Holy Spirit. The first thing that we have to understand this evening about this text and, and about pers being persistent in our prayer life and, and, and the, the glory that we can see in groans and the, the glory that we can see in these times of deliverance that may take time, the first thing is that God hears. God hears. It tells us right there in the passage in verse 24. And God heard their groaning. And God heard their groaning. Now what's unique about this, and, and it, when we hear that we say, sure, well God heard. Well, God's a busy man. You know, He's holding the whole world in His hands. He's the one who has created the entire universe. He's the one that sustains you and I. He's the one that creates all things and is the sustainer of all things. Yet He still finds time to hear us. It is a great privilege for us to know that we can be heard by God. It is a great privilege for us to know that we can be heard by God. And I don't know about you, but there's times in life where you feel, you feel overwhelmed with all that's within you. There's times when you feel like there, there is nothing that is hopeful. Those times that when you are praying desperately for God to heal that person in your life who has cancer. When you pray for God to provide that job for you that you're applying for. Or maybe to provide you with a job since you may have just lost it. It would be a strange question to ask if, we had, if I had said it. Who all has felt this way before? Because many of us have. Many of us have. And what we have to understand, and what brings us great joy is that when we, when we get in those moments, we can understand that God hears us. God hears us. He hears His children. Samuel Rutherford, another uh, Puritan of old, on prayer, he says, when others cannot know what a groan means, God knows. Because His Spirit is the one that made the sigh. He first makes prayer as an intercessor, and then He hears it as God. There's a lot of books out there written on prayer, and there's a lot of people's opinions on what prayer is, but the Scriptures give us a few examples. One of those is, obviously, is in the Psalms, a verbal prayer to God. In other areas, it is merely an utterance, or a time of weeping, or of crying, or even of just looking up to heaven with a saddened face. I don't know how many of you ever looked up to your mom or to your dad and, and you didn't have to say anything and they just knew that something was wrong. They knew that you needed help. And many times they already knew what you needed help for and with. And they were there to help you. It is the same way with our Father. There are many times that when we groan in our prayer, when we cannot find the words to say because of the burden is so, so heavy that He looks down and He knows and he hears. He hears that cry and that weeping. He hears that time in our life where we are praying for leaders to raise up in our church, praying for things to happen that we want to happen. He knows when those things are happening. And he knows that when we don't have the words to speak, he knows what the words are on our hearts. Because he is the one that put them there. He is the one who has provided us with the rescue from the burden and the, with the redemption that we have in Christ. And the beauty of it is that His ear is never deaf to His children. His ear never ignores what His children have to say. Our God never says, no, I don't have time for that. He never says, no, I don't have time to hear your prayer. I'm too busy over here. I'm too busy doing this. He says, no, no, I hear you. I hear you. And not only do I hear you, but as we'll see in a minute, 
in a minute. He remembers the promises that He has made to you. And the promises that He has made through the redemption in Christ. But another thing that we have to see in here is that He did not react to their slowness of response. And what I mean by that is it, it took them 40 years before we see in the text that they groaned out and cried out to God. God didn't respond to their delay at the beginning. He didn't respond to the slowness that they had to come to Him. He let them make a fool of themselves, as we all do. And then He hears them. And He responds. He responds by delivering them, as we see later on through the text. He delivers them through the slavery that they are within Egypt. He delivers us from our sin through the death and resurrection of Christ. He delivers us from our hopelessness by giving us hope. From our death by giving us life. He is the great deliverer. He first responds to their desperate cry. He responds to their cry. Because he knows at this point that their heart is where it should be. Focused on God. Not focused on the hope of earthly things in their life, but focused on things of God, things that matter, things of eternity. Focus on the one thing that can make a difference. Focus on the God who hears. The omniscient God who is all-knowing. The omnipresent God who is everywhere at one time. And the omnipotent God who can do all things because He is all-powerful. The God who hears. Are you weary this evening, church? Are you desperate for the things that God has for you? Are you desperate for just a breath of life and a relief from the stress in your daily world? Are you lonely? Are you lost? Have you lost all hope in things that are to come? Then I urge you, I urge you to do as the Israelites did and to moan, to cry out to God because He hears. Our God is the God who hears. Our God is the God who not only hears, but He acts. He delivers. Psalm 55, 16 through 19 says this. But I call to God, and the Lord will save me. Evening and morning and at noon, I utter my complaint and moan, and He hears my voice. He redeems my soul in safety from the battle that I wage. For many are arrayed against me. God will give ear and humble them, He who is enthroned from of old, because they do not change and they do not fear God. When David writes this, he is in severe turmoil because he feels as, as though Saul is about to take his life or is hunting him down. And he says, I call out to God and He saves me. Our God not only hears, but He acts. He hears and He responds. He hears and He has compassion and grace for us. For you and for me. But God not only hears, but He also remembers. That's the second thing this evening. Is that God remembers. He remembers His covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. The promises of the offspring that is to come. He remembers the promise of redemption that He has in Christ. And He remembers the promise that He gives to, he gives to you and I when we come to know Jesus. That we will have eternal life. Charles Spurgeon in his, in his beautiful devotion, Morning and Evening, he, paint, he paints a beautiful picture of what it's like to have hope amidst hopelessness. He says, don't you know that on the other side of every mountain is a beautiful valley? On the other side of every great current is a calm creek. On the other side of every great storm is a beautiful, dew-filled, grassy morning. At the end of our suffering, there is beauty. And there is hope. At the end of our time in life, there is eternity. There is a place where streets are filled with gold and the gates are made of pearls. And, it's, and the place is well lit by nothing but the glory of God and the glory of Christ. There is a place that we can look forward to. There is a day that we can look forward to where this pain will go away. For these things we so urgently desire, so eagerly seek, will be at our fingertips. Because we will be there. There will be a day when there is no more cancer. There will be a day when there is no more tears. And there will be an old glorious day 
where we no longer have to pray for Jesus to come back because we're there with him every day for eternity. Our God is faithful. He is faithful to his promises. He is faithful to the things that he says in his word. He is faithful to fulfill these things. He is faithful to his eternal promise that we have as sons and daughters of Christ and as children of God. He is faithful in his marriage to us through Christ. He is faithful in all things. Do not think for a moment that when we go through just a small time of persecution or a small time of suffering or a small time of hopelessness in our life or, or maybe it's just a small time of burdensome stress that our God has forgotten us because He is not. He hears our cries and He remembers the promises that He has. He is not like fallible men and depraved fathers who make empty promises and forget their commitments. He is faithful. He is infallible. He is omniscient. He is omnipotent. And He is faithful to His children. And He is faithful to those who He calls by name. He is faithful to those who He has saved. No church, He is faithful to you. He is faithful to you. In Scripture, we have a beautiful picture of Jesus as the bridegroom and the church as the bride. Ray Ortland, in a book that I'm sure Dr. J has, has probably mentioned, but one that you all should read, is Marriage and the Mystery of the Gospel by Ray Ortland. And he paints a beautiful picture of the relationship between Christ and the church as a marriage. I don't, I'm about to get married, so I've been reading a whole lot of books on marriage. And you know, books is not necessarily as good as experience, but this was pretty good. He paints the beautiful picture of how marriage and how God is faithful to His bride. Even when we are unfaithful. Even like the picture He, he paints in the prophets when he tells the prophet to go and to marry a prostitute. Because that's how, it's, that's how the, the relationship between God and Israel was at that time. And what, is, what, is, what does the prophet do? He continues to marry her when, he, when she begins to be unfaithful. He continues to pursue her. Why? Because God loves us. Because God cares for us. Because God remembers the promises that he gives us. The promises that are in his word. The promises that he gives us in, in the Psalms. And the promises that He gives us when, when He tells us that Christ will save us, that Christ has come to seek and to save the lost. The promises of eternity that we have and that we can seek and that we can hold. God is faithful to those things. While yet we can see so short a distance, we must remind ourselves that there is a home far away that is ours. That is where our citizenship lies. That is where our God resides. And that is where our Savior is coming to take us. And do not forget that God remembers. He remembered the promises and the covenant that He made with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. He knew that He was not going to forget the Israelites. He knew that He was not going to leave them in slavery. He remembered those things. He remembered the great promises that He had made. God not only remembers, but He also sees. God sees. He's all seeing. He's, omni He's omnipresent. He's everywhere at one time, which means He can see all things at one time. It also shows us in this passage here that our God is a personal God. He's a God who sees His people. He may reside in heaven, but He is with each one of us today. He sees you. He knows when you, when you bow to pray. He knows when you are crying. Not only does He hear your cries and remember His promises, but He sees you in that moment of turmoil in your life. He sees you working diligently and stepping up in leadership roles in your church and of serving faithfully. He sees you doing these things. He knows. He sees all things. We cannot hide from the eyes of God. We cannot hide from the eyes of God. Israel couldn't do it. David couldn't do it. We sure can't do it. 
We cannot hide from the eyes of God and neither can we hide our sorrows that we may have. Neither can we hide the burdens that we may have. Neither can we hide the things that are so dear to us. We cannot hide these things from God. Because our God sees. He sees behind the groans that we make. He sees beyond the marrow and the bone of our body. He sees down deep into our souls. And He sees through our weak prayers and awakens the child within us who desperately needs their Father's help. He sees past the covers up, cover up that we put on. He, set, he sees past the manly presence that we try to guard ourselves with. He sees past these things because He's our Father. He is our Father. And I don't know about you, but a father always loves his child. He always loves his children. I'll never forget there was a time that I had, uh, uh, I'm from North Alabama, and my dad and I had uh, gone to the hunting club to work, and we were cutting trees and things. And uh, my dad had told me to go and to, to, to cut one down to a certain place, and I had gone, and I thought I'd take a short, shortcut getting back to where everybody was, and I got lost. And I was, I was like 13 or 14. I was just scared to death. And I began just to, just, just to scream dad. And, and I, when I say I was 13 or 14, I was about the same size at 13 or 14. So it's kind of embarrassing. I'm crying out for my dad, lost in the woods that I spent every weekend in. But I was terrified. By about the third time that I said dad, he was there. He was there. Come to find out, I was right behind him. And uh, I wasn't so lost after all. But I tell you that story to tell you this. As soon as I cried out for my father, he was there. Even though I wasn't so far away, He was there. And He was there to deliver me. He was there to keep me safe. And when we cry out to our Heavenly Father, oh, it is even more. Because He looks down and He sees. He sees you and me. He sees everything that we do in life. And He knows. He knows how we feel. He knows the burdens that we have. God knew. God knew. That's the last words of the verse. And it really, it really bothered me when I was studying this text because it goes from God saw the people of Israel and God knew. God knew what? What did God know at this point? God knew, much like a father knows. He saw the people of Israel and he knew. He knew that they needed help. I don't know about you, but mama always knew. She always knew when I was in trouble. She always knew when I was hurt. Sometimes she would know before I even called her. I don't know how, but she did. Even when I was in trouble, even when I was in pain from something dumb that I had probably done. She never reacted to the action that I did, but she first comforted me. She first helped me. She first had compassion upon me. In these few verses, we can see that God, in the, well, actually in the next few chapters, God calls out to Moses and tells him to go to set his people free. He uses Moses. Because God looked down, he saw the people of Israel, and he knew. And he reacted. He responded according to his will. Now what we have to understand is that many times when we pray, there's not an answer. At least an answer that we can see. I've seen a lot of death in my life, in my short years, especially as a, as a young teenager and young child. I've had friends who have who've killed themselves, and, and I've seen people die of cancer. When you pray for God to heal them, and it doesn't come true, it does something to you. 
the beauty of it is it does. It does come true. Because those people are now spending eternity in heaven. They are pain free. They are with the Father. They are where I want to be. They are in our home. They are there. And God knows what we pray for. And He knows those great burdens on our life. He knows how we feel and how we feel towards Him. And what we have to understand is that our God is a big God. Our God is a big God who can handle our temper tantrums. Our God is a big God who can handle our 40 years of hoping in other things and then the moment we call to Him, He is there. Our God is a God of compassion. He knows your burden. He knows your callings that is on your life. He knows your desires. He knows your wants and your needs. But what we have to understand is that when God answers prayer, He answers it in accordance with His will. God answers prayer in accordance with His will. For many of us, that is tough. And that is a very hard line to draw between prayer and God's sovereignty. And really, it's not even a line at all. Because we must have trust in Christ. We must have faith in the things that God has promised us. We must have faith in who God is and in what God does and in the plan that He has for our life and in the ultimate plan that He has. We have faith in who God is. Because He knows us. Because He formed us. Because we are made in His image. Because He hears us and He sees us. Because He listens to us amidst His busy schedule and He responds to us. He places people in our lives who comfort us. He places people in our lives that many times we are not aware that He uses to answer our prayers. God hears. God remembers. God knows. And God sees all that is within your life. Our God is a great God. Our God is a God that can deliver us. Our God is a God who wants His people to be whole. In Micah chapter 6, He said, well, what is it that I should do? Love justice. Love kindness. And walk humbly with your God. And then we come to a conclusion this evening. I would like to read a short hymn for you. And then we'll have our hymn of invitation. The hymn is titled, Take Time to Be Holy. And as we think about what Christopher Love had said about when prayer is heard, when the man's heart is right with God, Remember this hymn and listen to these words. Take time to be holy. Speak off with thy Lord. Abide in Him always and feed on His Word. Make friends of God's children. Help those who are weak, forgetting in nothing His blessing to seek. Take time to be holy. The world rushes on. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. By looking to Jesus, like Him thou shalt be. Thy friends and thy conduct. His likeness shall see. Take time to be holy. Let Him be thy God. And run not before Him, whatever be tired. In joy or in sorrow, still follow thy Lord. And look into Jesus, still trust in His Word. Take time to be holy. Be calm in thy soul. Each thought and each motive beneath His control. Thus lead us by His Spirit to fountains of love. Thou soon shall be fitted for service of God. Take time each day to be holy. Take time each day to spend with the Lord. And take time each day to remember that our God hears. Our God remembers the promises that He's made to us. He knows all things. And He sees all things. Our God has not forgotten us. No matter what it is in life, we make it our God loves us. 
and never forget you are to share his love with one another. As we come to the time of invitation.